Uh, turn in your Bibles tonight to Exodus chapter 9. And we're going to start reading in Exodus chapter 9 uh, in verse 18. And what we're reading about is the plague of hail in Egypt. There's just one more of the plague, excuse me, one more of the plagues that the Lord had to put on Egypt until Pharaoh would finally cry uncle and say, you know, it's time for you guys to leave. This is the plague of hail. We're going to read. We're going to read some Bible. We're going to read down to verse thirty-four. Uh, so let's do this. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into our text. Father, we're thankful tonight. Really thankful for the missionary um, reports. So thankful for the church's generosity with Brother Comer. I'm quite sure <clears throat> that every penny that's coming his way is he's going to find is absolutely necessary. And while it may seem like a lot to give, it on the one hand, it's nothing when we consider that all of this provision has come from you. I thank you for the hearts of the people here that are so uh, generous and desirous to help. Father, we uh, have heard some good praises tonight and are so thankful for that. We've got the Bible Club and the teens going on tonight. Father, I surely pray for all of their teachers. You fill them with your Holy Spirit. Bring glory to your name through the work that you're doing in their lives. I pray that our lives will change from the things we hear and hear tonight. Help us to listen. Help us to understand. Help us to apply. Help us to be encouraged by the things that we hear. Help us to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so we can get this work done in a way that's pleasing to you and that will accomplish what you desire, for we ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Exodus chapter 9 and verse 18 the Bible says, Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Worst hailstorm they've ever had. Send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die, man and beast. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt upon man and upon beast, and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail, and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt, since it became a nation. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb of the field and brake every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. So the amazing thing here is that God severed Israel, as he did in some of these other plagues, from the Egyptians so that all this hail is covering all of Egypt, but those guys that are there, the children of Israel, they're not getting any of this. Clear skies. Verse 27. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough, that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease. Neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how that the earth is the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that you will not yet fear the Lord God. And the flax and the barley was smitten. For the barley was in the ear and the flax was bold. It's kind of like cotton when it bowls like that. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up, so they had just been planted. 
And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread abroad his hands unto the Lord, and the thunders and hail ceased, and the rain was not poured upon the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So it didn't work. <laughs> I mean, it looked like there for a moment, oh, Pharaoh was going to give in, but Moses said, I, I know, I know, I know you. You're, you're not, you're not gonna, you're not, you're not gonna yet fear the Lord. He said, I knew that, I knew that when I came over here. He says in verse 30, as for thee and thy servants, I know you will not yet fear the Lord God. He walked out of town. He stops the thunders. He stops the rain. He stops the hail. And as soon as Pharaoh saw those things stopped, he said, he hardened his heart and he and his servants. Now, some very important things to learn from this text of scripture. Uh, you know, it's, it's important to recognize that God takes care of His people. That when He brought that um, plague on Egypt, children of Israel spared. And, and it's important for us to recognize that, that though we have gone through some things in our lives, I, I've, I've talked around, if I sit down and talk to every one of you here, you've gone through some things in your life that have been hard. But as a Christian, God has blessed you in ways that you haven't gone through those things the same way that people who are out in the world have gone through them. Do you understand? God has separated us so that there are some things like the children of Israel where we recognize the blessing of God, uh, where the rest of the world sees it as a plague. And I can think of many instances, but it's not uncommon when we're mourning the loss of a loved one. To, to look up and smile because of the presence of the grace of God, because of the filling of the Spirit of God, because of the comfort of the Spirit of God, and to say, you know what, this is bad, but I don't know how the rest of the world goes through a thing like this. If you recognize there's just this hand of God in it like there was for Israel. Another thing that we, we recognize when we, when we read this is that Moses and Aaron had gone in there and they'd preached to Pharaoh and then they left. And so when, when, um, when Pharaoh needs to talk to Moses and Aaron about stopping this thing, you'll see in verse 27, Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron. So they're apparently over there where the rest of the children of Israel are, and, and it, it's a day like today for them. Cool, cool, cool air perhaps and clear skies and, and you know, they look over there and they see the big bad thundercloud and they hear all the noise and they, they can, uh, they can tell things are really bad over there. Do you understand that when Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron, they had to walk back through that storm? They had to leave the comforts of Goshen, if that's where they were, and go into that fire and hail and thunder and rain to get to Pharaoh. And this is not something, you know, you could just take a little... Mary Poppins umbrella and walk into this hail is so bad it's breaking trees. Now you may have been through a hailstorm. I've I've been through them. Uh, the most memorable one is the is uh, right after Corinne was born in March of 1984. We our house the nursery was not ready and had just gotten out of the hospital. And my parents had remodeled their house, and they had two skylights in what we used to call the playroom, and all the children's bedrooms joined that playroom. And we were staying in one of those bedrooms right next to the to that when the hailstorm came at 4 o'clock in the morning. And I thought I was inside of a snare drum. <laughs> it was pounding. Well, we went outside after that hail had passed, and there was not a leaf on a tree all the magnolia leaves, all the oak leaves, everything's gone. And there is solid ice across the driveway and lawn and the street and into the next yards. It looks, it, it's the eeriest sight you've ever seen. But I'm going to tell you something, it's bad, and it, you should have seen our, our vehicle. It looked like they held the Olympic track meet on the vehicle. Man, it was beat up. But you know what? The trees weren't broken in that hailstorm talking to a friend of mine that has some apartments in Snyder when they had a hailstorm that came through there and those balls were so big they went through the roof 
and, and then through the walls inside the apartments after they came through the roof, through the ceiling, into the wall, and, and some of them even d divided the floors of the apartments after going through those three parts of the structure. Just terrible. That's a bad hailstorm. So this is a bad hailstorm. This is breaking trees, and Moses and Aaron have to walk back into that storm to get to Pharaoh. And that's not the most peculiar thing. They talk to Pharaoh and they say to Pharaoh in verse 29, Moses said unto him, as soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread upon my hands of the Lord. He had to walk back through the hail to get outside the city and then spread his arms. He didn't do it in the palace. And... Um, and you know, you know what happened because they survived this. I mean, this is so bad. Every man that is in the field that didn't go in, the Bible said, was destroyed. He's killed. All the animals and the men that were out there got killed. Moses and Aaron went in, came out, and didn't kill them. Which tells me exactly what you see. It is going, it's like walking in this pulpit. It's going on all around them, over them, and beside them, but it's not getting them. Here is the morals of this story and a couple of things we'll say about it. This is the point. It's a Wednesday night. I don't need to give you four points and a conclusion and a poem. <laughs> Just get this one point. If you are going to do something for God, you're going to catch hail. H <laughs> A I L. <laughs> So if you're going to do something for God, you're going to catch hell. <laughs> and I'm not talking like a man from Alabama. <laughs> I'm talking about H-A-I-L. God's going to tell you, I want you to do something. You're going to look this way and it's going to take you right into a storm. And you have been where you are in the comforts of what you're experiencing right now. You're in a church on a Wednesday night. And you're comforted by the singing, comforted by the testimonies, comforted by the opportunity to do something good for a missionary. Comforted tonight by prayer for each other. And God may say, I want you to go do something. You're like, i got to walk through that storm to go do that. It just goes with the territory. It just goes with the territory. They were, listen, they walked into the storm, but they were supernaturally protected in the same way they were when they were in Goshen, if that's where they came from. God just tightened it up around them so they could go through that storm. Listen, God gave us the whole armor of God to sustain us in the work that God has called us to do. Turn with me to, um, you know the text so you don't have to come back here. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. This is not an unfamiliar passage to you, but I want you to look at it in the context of what you've heard tonight. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And that's, that hailstorm was not a flesh and blood thing. That's some bad stuff going on there. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers. Uh, Moses and Aaron were having to wrestle against that, that principality of Pharaoh, that power of Pharaoh. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. That's your Bible. And loins girt about with truth is where men would gird themselves and carry their swords and, and that kind of thing. So uh, you, you got that. You got the truth. Having on the blessed breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked fiery. He walked through a fiery hailstorm. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and so forth. You see, God didn't give us that armor so that we could be showboats or models. 
He gave us that armor because he said, I recognize when I call you to go do something for me, you're going to encounter spiritual opposition. Uh, we, we had a prayer request last week, week before last, from, from Brother Dobbins. We're reapplying, he said, for immigration status to go into Zambia to do the work God has called us to do. And we're being told now that Zambian government is cracking down on the entrance of missionaries and all of our prior 16 years count for nothing. We're starting over. That's opposition. That's walking into a storm. And yet he was certain that God was directing them to go back to that country and he could see already the hand of God in the preparations that they'd been making. But he did. He said, praying always with all prayer and supplication, watching thereunto with all perseverance, supplication for all saints. He was saying, we need to pray about this. Because easily that power of that government could have said, you're not coming in here. And God had to intervene. And then he told us later, he said, and praise the God, praise God, I've been granted the, the visa necessary to go into that country. We have another friend of ours in another country doing the same process. I won't mention the country because of the difficulty in that field. Same deal. They're there right now trying to get that situation dealt with right now with no assurance whatsoever. You know what? When you decide, listen, when you decide to follow God, God makes the decisions about what he wants you to do. But when you decide to follow God, you are going to meet with opposition. Um, Brother Dobbins had sent me a text this weekend of just appreciating y'all, appreciating so much this church, your support, your prayers, your love for him, our personal relationship with him and love and support of the work that they do there. And um, and he said, but you know, the closer we get to our departure, which is scheduled for August, um, the more spiritual opposition that we're meeting. That's this. You're going to walk into, if you're going to do something for God, you're going to catch hail. <laughs> You're going to walk into the storm. It, you, there's no, there's no other way to describe it, but you have to know that you are going to walk into that with a supernatural protection. With a supernatural protection, and that's very, very important. Listen, turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. This spiritual opposition, opposition is not singling you out to stop you. It can stop you. Uh, mo- mostly how it stops people is it convinces them not to even pursue this in the first place. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, I see how these other guys have to go through this. I don't think I want to, I don't think I want to deal with that. And so you stop before you ever get started. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in verse 4, 5, and 6, notice what Paul said to the Thessalonians. He said, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith. Watch it. In all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Wait a minute. These are guys that Paul led to the Lord Jesus Christ who have a very tender faith, who have begun to grow, who, are, who Paul loves immensely and has treated very courteously. He's, he's, he said about them in 1 Thessalonians, he said, I was as a nurse, you know, with cherishing her children, and uh, I was as a father, and I charged you, and such a close relationship. And he says, we glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. You say, well, wow, what a, what a way, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, what a, what a way for God to treat his own people. That's the opposition you get for doing something for God. You walk into the storm. You don't get out of the storm. Verse 5, which is a manif- it's a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now, why would God allow a thing like that to happen? He answers that in verses 11 and 12 of the same chapter, Second Thessalonians. Chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Wherefore, also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling, And, here it is, (coughs) fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, you know what? (coughs) Excuse me. 
He said, I want God to count you worthy of this calling. And to fulfill his good pleasure. And the work of faith with power. Why? So that Jesus Christ can be glorified in you and you in him. According to the grace of our God and his Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? I'm sitting here, I was just rejoicing tonight when he read that letter from Brother Rudolph because I have his prayer card and I go over that thing and we've gone, bless God, we've gone from 40 members to 10 members and we need a water filtration system and a new roof and a foundation. I'm thinking, you know what? That guy's just minutes from quitting. He's in a terrible storm. And then we get that letter. I got me a handful of 9 to 25 year old young men and I'm training and the constant prayer I pray for every missionary and man we support is that God will give them young men to train because that's where the work is going to get done. That's an amazing thing. You know what he did? He walked into that storm. That's where he, that's, he, the, the folks in that town know him <laughs> and he knows them and what they know of him from his past is not suitable for being a pastor. He walked right back into that cloud and said, I'm going to do what you want me to do because that's what you call me to do. And God evidently is getting involved in that thing. And you know what? It's a, it's a patient work because God has to f- fulfill his good pleasure. You see, we are, we get so results oriented in what we, we think we're going to do for God that, that we, we're, we kind of can't, measure the cost and the benefit of something we're about ready to go do for God. And we say, Moses could have easily said in the land of Goshen, Aaron, there is no need for us to go back in there and talk to Pharaoh. Let's just call off the storm from over here and save ourselves having to go into that mess. He's not going to change his mind anyway. But Moses and Aaron didn't stop because they knew he wasn't going to come around. They went on through all that, faced him, came back out of there through all of that, and then called off the storm because... That was God's good pleasure. That was to bring glory to God. And so they did it for that reason. Well, listen, it's good enough then if this is what God wants you to do and it's for His glory and for His pleasure and for that work of faith with power. In spite of the fact that you have to endure some hail when you go in to do it. Don't get so comfortable in the land of Goshen when God's stirring your nest for something that he has you to do and it's going to cause you some personal discomfort to do it. Opposition accompanies the work of God. Just go through the storm. If you're going to do something for God, what's the, what's the message? If you're going to do something for God, you're going to catch a little hail. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for... Clear instruction from the words of God. I ask you please in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to help us. Don't know how this would be applied in the lives of our people tonight, but I suppose there are some that have kind of backed up from doing something for you because they didn't see that it was going to be all that prosperous and they also saw there was going to be a lot of spiritual opposition. I pray they've been encouraged tonight not to worry about it, to go on and do what you called them to do anyway because that's for your glory and your pleasure. We ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.